Welcome to a homegrown family podcast where we grow the produce and the kids. Hey everybody, welcome to a homegrown family podcast. I'm your host Joe Mettler and today we have a special guest here, a new addition to my extended family, Ian. <laughs> hey guys. Ian is also a fellow mushroom forager, forage yeah. hunter, and uh, way more knowledgeable about this topic than myself. And so we're going to dive into a little bit more about this. Most of you are probably listening think, oh, well, the morel season's over, so who cares? Well, there's way more to mushrooms than morels. So let's start off with a little bit of background, Eden. Like, how'd you get into mushroom hunting or foraging? I guess, what's your perfect, what's your term? Well, I generally go foraging just because I go with plants as well as mushrooms, but it's all part of like the same ecosystem pretty much. So basically I started with my father. So when I was the age of about two, three, four, my dad would go out before and then find morels in different places and then remember where they were. He'd come back to the house, get my brother and I, then bring us out there. And then he'd make us, <laughs> at two or three, we'd have to go and like look for the morels. And then he'd point them out to us, and then we'd find them. And then, and then it just went on from there. And then mushroom hunted pretty much my whole life. My dad learned it from his father and his father learned it from his father before him. So it's just been a long, rich history. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's way different than my my voyage. I had my neighbor who's like kind of kind of found a couple spots and then mm-hmm. showed me one day, and I was like, "Oh, that's pretty cool." I wonder if we have somebody or some mushrooms like that. On my dad's property. So then I'm almost like a first generation mushroom gatherer, you know, forager. Oh, it's so true, a new immigrant to the society. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I started with morels. Then my grandfather and father they just stuck simply with morels because they didn't want to try anything else. And then I was curious, so I just started looking into new species and. I met some people that were telling me about chicken of the woods and chanterelles, and I had no idea what they meant. And so then I just started like researching a couple books and then researching online what different species there are out there. And then whenever I'd go out in the woods and walk around, I'd try to find different mushrooms and then just have no idea what they are, just grab them, bring them home, and then I'd spend like an hour looking them all up and trying to figure out what they were, whether they're edible, inedible, whether they had medicinal effects, or just they were just simply mushrooms that really didn't have a purpose and, well, to the human race but you know they still all have their purposes whether it be decomposing anything or being saprophytic and living off of a tree in harmony so it's very interesting just how much is out there every time i go in the woods i find something new what brought upon this this uh, discussion here this episode is that yesterday i was you know this whole weekend i've been visiting my aunts and uncle bill and christy and my cousins and everything down here in southern minnesota and uh we decided to go on a hike and ian and uh his new bride, my cousin Andrea, you know, mm-hmm. congratulations to them both. I'm uh, <laughs> looking forward to more interactions with this guy. But uh, so we went on this hike out in Forestville, and uh, I basically found three or four new mushrooms that I've never seen before in my life, so it's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it was awesome. We found a lot of golden oysters that were out there. So many. They're just in bloom, and those are, they're like the white oyster and the pink oyster, but they are actually from Europe and Asia. And they were brought over here in Decorah, Iowa, where they were growing them for food. And then that plant burned down, and the spores got out. And so now golden oysters are just prevalent in our woods. They are everywhere. And we found the golden oysters, and then we found some white jelly fungus. We found wood ear, which is actually an edible mushroom, which is actually really good. To me, that one seemed like it was really like rubbery feeling. It was, oh, it was yes. a little bit older, or is that normally how it feels? Well, it is rubbery feeling, but as it gets older, it dries out. And dies off, and then it shrinks down a little bit because the water is just leached out of it. But they're very rubbery, and they're a brownish red, and they grow all along dead, just trees that are decomposing. And huh. the taste is very mushroomy, is what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you say very mushroomy. I, I don't know. Like it's like uh, morels seem to me they don't, they don't have they're pretty fairly bland for the most mm-hmm. part. And then you have your puff balls, which is like taste whatever like you saute them with or whatever. Yeah, but um, the oysters to me have a little bit more of a potent taste. Oh yeah, I'm not you know I'm not sure that compares to the or how, how does the woods well, ear? Well, woods ear is way more mushroomy than oysters. Oysters are okay. more of a mild flavor, okay. and when it comes to mushrooms, like if you try king bolites, those are much more much more mushroomy. Hedgehogs are choice as well, and hedgehog mushrooms are less than king bolites. And less than woodier, but more than oysters. And <laughs> it's kind of interesting how you go on all of them. Because, like, if you look at dryad saddle or pheasant back, pheasant backs, they smell like cucumber or watermelon rind. 
when you smell them. Like, if you break them open and smell them, that's the smell that you get from yeah, them. Yeah, because that's another one that we find in my dad's woods all the time is the pheasant mm-hmm. backs. Yep, and good. I always thought they smelled interesting. I don't, I don't know if I ever pictured it with, like, a watermelon oh. umber thing. If you break them open and smell them, that's what you'll smell. I, like, I'm going to have to do yeah. that next time. Oh, you should. It's really <laughs> it's really interesting. I Like, pheasant backs are a great mushroom. I like to dry them out, and then I use them for vegetable stocks and mushroom stocks. Oh, sure. So when you're making, like, ramen or any soup or stew in the yeah. winter especially, oh, it is just phenomenal. So you, like, can, can up the... So stock you make and yep. Yeah, so I have a dehydrator, and then I just cut them into strips, and I make sure that the pheasant backs are young and not hard. Because if you take a knife and you open it up, and then you just with little pressure slice into it, whenever it stops, that's the the part that it slides through easily is the part you want to eat. Mm. So you can cut around the rings of the outsides of these huge ones, and you still get the nice ready mushroom. Yep. Where the inside is just so hard, it's not even worth your while. And yeah. then I just cut them in slices and then dry them out in a dehydrator. Then after that, I throw them in jars with an oxygen absorber. And then they keep for What's, like a year or two. What kind of oxygen absorber? It's like the silico, like silica. Oh, like silica packets? Yeah, silica okay, packets. Yeah. You can buy yeah. a huge 500 pack on Amazon for, and yep. that'll last you a lot of mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, you only put like the one quarter size packet in there, you're done. Yeah, in like a quart, jar. Yeah, for a quart size jar. And just nice. make sure you have them dehydrated all the way so there's no water. You can never over dehydrate a mushroom. Good to know. So you can just leave that running for days and days because if you leave moisture in there, then it'll mold even yeah. with the uh, oxygen absorber. Huh. The more you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. But they're great for stocks and soups. And But if you dry them out, they do get tough. So then that's why you just use it for stocks and you get the nice flavor and the nutrients from it. Yeah. Okay. So like the other one that I didn't see before. I really never really heard about was the white jelly that we saw. Yesterday. Oh, yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that one. Okay, so the white jelly, that one's, it's considered more of a rare mushroom, but around here in southeast Minnesota, in the bluff land, I find it everywhere. It really loves moisture, and what they use it for is, especially in places like China and the east, they dry it out, they grind it up, and they use it in like face cream products to like re-moisturize your skin. So what I've done before, too, is I've just taken it and then rub it in my hands and just slather it over my body. And <laughs> it feels good. That's the, I, I don't know how much is there or how much I'm getting from it, but it just feels good. So I do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's very... <laughs> I, was, I was surprised with the, like, the texture of it. It was very spongy feeling. And like, I, yeah, I don't know. It's not, not any of the texture. It's not similar to in texture to like the oysters, morels, or the... Yeah. Maybe a little bit of the morels, but still more spongy. Oh, yeah. It's very much like jello. It's, it's yeah, crazy. Yeah, that's good. And it, <laughs> that's the consistency it is. And it's yeah. just white and it almost looks like a cauliflower mushroom, but just way smaller and it grows on logs because it yeah. breaks down the trees. It's not like a cauliflower where it grows out of the earth. You're talking about the difference between like a decomposing mm-hmm. mushroom versus like a terrestrial mm-hmm. type mushroom. Is there anything else you can elaborate with the differences there? Well, so it's all based on the species and how the mycelium works. So all those mushrooms are different. And basically, the terrestrial that move around in the earth, that spreads out the mycelium through all the soil. And then once it hits the right temperatures and the right conditions, what happens is it fruits a fruiting body. So mushrooms are actually the fruit of the plant. And the plant actually lives in the mycelium in the earth or the tree. And then it sprouts up, and that is like, it's like an apple from an apple tree. So you have an apple tree there, and then when it produces fruit, you have the apple. And that creates the seeds for it, or for the mushroom, it would be spores. And so one of the interesting things is you can pick, if any mushrooms are out there, you can pick them and not affect the next year's harvest whatsoever. Because, right. and God knows we're going to miss some. So it's like, <laughs> you're not going to get all of them. There's no way. Yeah. So it kind of brings up a little bit of a topic like, sometimes people say, well, you just pinch the mushrooms or cut them off. Yeah. Do you have a preference of how you do that? So, basically, it determines on what I go for. So, if I don't have a knife, I pinch all of them. But, right. <laughs> <laughs> but if I have a knife, I generally use that and just because it's a cleaner cut and you get less dirt on it. So, I always try to make sure to wash my mushrooms and because I don't really like having a big uh, handful of dirt in my mouth. Like, that's not really that enjoyable for me. And <laughs> yeah. so I always use a knife, generally. And then when I'm out looking, I always have a mesh bag. That way, the spores can spread while you're walking with them. Yep. And after all, we're just spore spreaders in the grand scheme of things. 
So, <laughs> bringing things from one place to the next. But just use the knife. It's a cleaner cut. Like oysters especially. Like when you get a big clump of golden oysters, you can just cut right along the base and the clump stays together. And I think eating is half presentation. And oh, yeah. it looks a lot prettier when you have a big old clump and you cook that in and then just mushrooms here and there. For things like chaga, because I love harvesting chaga, mm-hmm. that is a mushroom that only grows on birch trees. And it's an old growth mushroom. And so it will infect a a cut or a blemish in the birch tree. And then slowly over time, it will grow into a big ball. Just It's black as coal. It only grows on birch. Hard as can be. And it's hard as can be. It's just... It's, it feels like wood when you grab it. Yeah. So I generally use an axe <laughs> or a hammer and knock that stuff off. Then I take it and then I dry it all out because yeah. you only harvest in the winter because the moisture content is the lowest then because the trees aren't running that much sap up and down. So because of that, the mushroom gets mostly dried out. So then you yeah. chisel it off and always make sure to leave a little bit of the chaga still on the tree because that chaga will grow back in another 10, huh. 5, 10 years. For sure, we have a couple of chaga sitting in my dad's place there on some birches, and I just never know what to do with it. You oh. know, you hear people grinding it up and making, like, teas and stuff, but I just oh, yeah. never... Yeah, what do you do with chaga? Like, so, what I do with chaga is I use it and put it in my coffee every morning. So, I get a whole bunch of it, and then I take it in a coffee grinder after it's all dry, and I <laughs> and I grind it all up, I just take little bits of it, grind it up with my coffee grounds, and then I use a French press in the morning, so I put it in the French press... Let it sit in the boiling water for about five to ten minutes, and then after that, I just put it down and drink it right with my coffee. It's very healthy for you. It's also a natural blood thinner, so if you're taking blood thinners, be careful how much chaga you have. But it's very healthy. It's good for your mind. It's good for your cardiovascular system, and it's just super healthy. It's great. Now, I always thought it would taste kind of funky, but if you just put it in your coffee, something you're already drinking, you have a coffee flavor mostly, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. The, it's mostly coffee flavor. You can taste a little bit of the chaga, but chaga is so mild. Like, you can even have it as tea. You can put it in as a tincture. And so, with a lot of the more medicinal mushrooms, you can make tinctures out of them, which is what I've done, yeah. where you get both nutrients from boiling, because a lot of the nutrients in mushrooms, you can either extract from boiling, which is one set of nutrients, and using alcohol for the other set of nutrients. Mm-hmm. So if you want to make a tincture, you just boil the chaga for, well, I'm not going to give you exact instructions, but you boil it for, for a long time. I have the recipe at home. And then after that, you take it out and then you put that chaga in like Everclear, the alcohol, and yeah. you let it sit there for a couple weeks. Then after that, you mix the two together and then you have vials of all the nutrients in chaga. Yep. Yeah, I did, I did that back, uh, not with mushrooms, but like mint. Mm-hmm. I want to make a mint, t- mint tincture. And, uh, yeah, I just basically boil it and then add it to Everclear. And... Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting how it all works. And then you can add in all sorts of things. And even out in the woods, there's more than just edible mushrooms. And most species of mushrooms aren't really medicinal or edible by humans. They're just there working in the environment. But there's very common ones called turkey tail and false turkey tail. Oh, we saw those yesterday yeah. too, right? We yeah. did see those yesterday. Yeah. And the thing with those is they are they are not edible. Well, you can't eat them. They won't kill you, but they're not tasty and they do not have a good mouthfeel at all. I've tried. <laughs> but they're extremely healthy for you in tinctures and teas. And so those are some very easy, calm ones you can go out. There's no dangerous lookalikes to them. And the pattern looks just like just like a turkey tail with the same coloration of browns, reds, and a little bit of like more yellow orangish. Yeah. It's, they're really pretty and they're super healthy for you. They're great for your brain. We saw some other red ones yesterday also. Oh yeah. You remember what? The yeah, one? those are the artist conchs. And so artist conchs are, they're a bracket type fungi that grow on dying trees and dead trees. And the top of it's all red. And then underneath you have a smooth white underside, which is where all the spores come from for it. But if you take it off, one interesting thing you can do with it is you remove the mushroom, then underneath, that side is just, it's like a clean slate that you can carve into. You can carve anything you want into it, and then if you dry out that mushroom, it will hold that drawing forever. And so that's why they call it artist comp. So, like, I have and some of my friends, you know, they've carved different things into it and then save them, and they're really cool, like, pieces (laughs) of art just on a natural mushroom. I like that's something, if a person found enough of them, they can bring them to, like... You know, Andrea's Montessori 
classroom yeah. for like an art project day or something. And they oh, could, yeah. That'd be really cool if they start collecting a bunch of those. And Oh, yeah. It would be sweet. I think it would be so cool to do that. Those conks, they take a, like a slow-growing mushroom. They take a while to get yeah. that size because they're kind of harder also. Yes. They do take a little bit longer to get to that size, and you can watch them year over year. But generally, you can find small ones. You can find big ones. And then they just grow, and then you take them off, and pretty much any type any type of artist conch, any size you can use for it. But if you want a bigger one, just wait a while. If you want smaller ones, just take them right as you see them. So, yeah. One other one that we did see, but it was a little past its prime, was uh, Chicken of the Woods. Yeah, we found a pretty popular one. Oh, it's really popular. It's so good. It, it's another shelf fungi that likes hardwoods a lot. So you look on it on dead hardwood trees. And they even grow on pines and other things. It's generally said to only take them from the hardwoods. But they taste phenomenal. They are just like chicken. They have the same consistency. And the interesting thing is they have a higher protein content than chicken. Huh. So that chicken of the woods is like has more protein in it for you. One time I heard this, and I think it's a fact. I haven't quite looked it up myself yet, but I always say it to people. <laughs> yeah, that's, those are the best kind. <laughs> you know, but it's like a... Uh, Bell pepper will have more vitamin C than an orange. I don't oh, know. Have you heard that? I have not heard that. I, I, I need to Google it now it. that I put it out here. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> ah, who needs but I was Google? Like, wow, no way. So <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. And is it the is it the uh, chicken of the woods that also is like a special interaction between two different fungi that result in that? No, fungi body I, no, that's that's uh, what you're talking about is a lobster mushroom. Yes, that's what and I'm so. Lobster mushrooms, they actually are parasitic to other mushrooms. And so generally the bolete family grows and then a lobster mushroom spore lands on it, infects it, takes it over. Then it becomes like this, it's terrestrial, so it's out of the ground. And it is like a orange, reddish orange claw shape. And it tastes like seafood. I found those around here too, quite a bit of them. Yeah, that's what I want to see because the interaction there is so interesting. Yeah, it's just weird because they just take it over and then... Even if that lobster lands on a poisonous mushroom, it turns it edible, which is so really? interesting. Yeah, because wow. it actually becomes the lobster mushroom. The base mushroom that got parasitized, yeah. that one's not really desirable, is it? Or it no, just... generally they're not that desi- desirable. So, yeah, but so it's so... turning something that's like, yeah, to yeah, it's really taste. Perfect, it. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I found, them, I found them a lot in pine woods. I don't know why I found them there, but I found quite a bit in pine woods. Well, that's around here anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, in southern Minnesota. <laughs> I've also found them up northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, and some in the Appalachians as well. I found them. So yeah, I, I just need to start walking around in my dad's woods a little bit more often. Mm-hmm. So we usually the early season stuff like the morels and things, um, but there's definitely found oysters out there now. Yeah, and puffballs. But I haven't seen any of the other things. But right now is kind of when some of those other things are. Yeah, starting to come out. It's starting to come out. Yeah. So here, so here we yeah so here we are in. Uh, Mid June, so mid to late June and yeah. into July, you can start finding some of these other mushrooms that we've been talking about. Oh, exactly. Like, so mushrooms all have their niche. And so there's some early spring mushrooms, there's some like summer mushrooms, and there's some late fall mushrooms. So one of my favorites in the late fall is called Lion's Mane, and mm-hmm. that it looks just like a hairball on oak trees. And it is shaggy and just like a lion's mane, like its name. And it's and you can eat it. It's a choice mushroom. It tastes wonderful. But also, it's medicinal as well. It's great for brain function and neuroactivity. And you can just find it, but only in the fall. And that's the interesting thing, where you have other, like, just like if you ever go into a forest consistently throughout the year, you can see the spring plants come up early and flower right away for the pollinators and for the insects. And then all of those die out. And then you get the summer plants. And then the summer plants die out. Then you get the fall plants. It's really interesting. Mums are a great example because a lot of people are familiar with those that where they bloom only in the fall. Mm-hmm. And so a whole forest is like that as well, where you get certain species in the spring and then certain species summer, certain species fall. It's super interesting how it all works. The ones that are coming up this summer, chanterelles are going to start coming in. And those are just wonderful mushrooms. I generally find the yellow chanterelles near me and they're, they're yellow and kind of orangish. And they look just like, just like an, oh man, it's kind of, it's hard to say. It's like a jack-o'-lantern plant, hmm. like jack-o'-lantern, but jack-o'-lantern is the poisonous look like to it. They come out of the ground. They have gills on the sides that, that are not actually gills. They're false gills. 
and then you can tell because they go down the stem and end. Oh. And then the top is somewhat indented, and they are orange and yellow, and they are wonderful, and they smell like apricots. So if you huh. break one open, you can smell apricots in it. Is that a distinguishing distinguishing feature from the... From the jack-o'-lantern. Yeah, the jack-o'-lantern is the common look-like, and that one's very poisonous. Right. But jack-o'-lanterns grow in big clumps, where chanterelles grow just in ones. So, if you see a big clump of the orange, that's probably a jack-o'-lantern, where they have a whole bunch coming out from one root base. Yeah. Where chanterelles each have their individual root bases. The other interesting thing about a jack-o'-lantern is that it glows in the dark. So, if you're out in the woods, they actually glow in the dark at night. The jack o' lanterns. That's how they got their name. So don't eat that one. Yeah, yeah. don't eat that one. That Those one's in the dark. It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that good. But chanterelles, like they're very easy to see, especially if you see pictures side by side. You can easily tell the differences. And it is, they're just both beautiful mushrooms. But the chanterelles also taste wonderful. I love frying it up with onions and butter, then putting it right on a steak. That's my favorite way to eat them. <laughs> so so far, I've, just, I've kind of just done like a yeah, saute to put on a burger, yep, kind of thing. Probably up with some eggs or whatever. But I've never had the chanterelles. But yeah, one day, you know, I, we're talking about this, and I'm like, golly, I grew up on you know, dad, 460 acres, we could go roam around, didn't really know anything about these things, mm-hmm. and now it's like, wow, like I probably could have like taken advantage of that if I knew a little <laughs> bit more about this type of stuff, and took advantage of the different seasons, and you know, you really get the. You know, the springtime, you're chasing, putting the cows out for the first time of the year. Yep. You catch some of this stuff. And you catch some of it again when it comes to fall when you're deer hunting. Yeah. Like, like the, the summertime, I kind of missed the, I missed the woods life in the summer. Because I was always just by the house, you know, playing with the sticks and stones or whatever. But Oh, exactly. <laughs> See, around here in southern Minnesota, we have, we have a berry called a black cap. Which is, that's the term that we all call it around here. But it's known as a black raspberry. And so when I was a kid... My grandfather and my dad and me would go out and just have ice cream buckets and then we'd just fill up with all the black caps. And so there's so much you can forage and there's a lot of berries that happen in the summer. There's a lot of different plants that you can harvest in the summer as well. And there's some plants that are extremely tasty that nobody knows of. It's like wood sorrel is super common. Oh, yeah. A lot of people call it sour grass, but I love adding that to salads. It's available generally from the spring through the summer. And it is phenomenal. It tastes like lemons. High in vitamin C. It's yeah. It's a perfect salad addition. It's super easy to find. There's like there's no common lookalikes, and it is just a wonderful summer green that well, just and, grows everywhere. And wood sorrel, <laughs> if it's the if it's the the weed that I'm familiar with, I call it a weed just because yeah. I'm more of like an agricultural background. So it's the crop <laughs> field. It's like it's a weed, right? Oh, there's no such thing as a weed in my book. Well, right. Yeah, yeah. there's always something you can. I mean, what's it the definition of a weed? If it's plant out of place, well, it depends on your perspective, right? Yeah. But um, what's sorrel? Don't they have like the heart-shaped leaves? Yeah, they almost look like a smaller type of clover. Yeah, yeah, really. And so they also have long banana-like pods for their seeds and their flowers. And those are so tasty. You get even more sourness from them whenever you have them. Yeah. And they're high in vitamin C and it's great. And a lot of the wild plants that you gather, they're more tasty and less bitter in the spring. So you want to look for new shoots and new leaves. Those are the ones that are the most tasty. Where you can still eat the other ones, like plantain, for example. It's generally in a lot of people's yards. People don't yep. really think about it at all. But that's a very it's very nutritious for you. It's very good. Especially in when it's young, but when it gets older it gets bitter. You can still eat it, but I'd recommend the newer shoots. Yeah. And the newer leaves. Yeah, you're talking about all the different things that are edible apart from mushrooms here. Well my brother Lawrence this last year got into Ferns, and I forget what they're oh, called. Oh yeah, fiddleheads. Yeah, fiddleheads. Yeah. yeah, and we grew up with these ferns, you know, that we always play around with, hack off the sticks or you know what I mean. Yeah. And then also, the ferns like you can eat those. I'm like, what? And I just remember the ferns just an aroma that I don't always find pleasant, but oh yeah. But then we're just taking the little fiddlehead neck part of it, the yeah, the new growth for it before it elongates out, right? Yeah. And. You've eaten those as well? I have, yeah. No, they're really good. I, I like them. There's certain types of ferns you want to go for. Right, that's what you're saying too, yeah. And so there's certain fern species you want to look away from. And off the top of my head, I don't really know which ones. But I know they're out there, and I've gathered them before with a couple of my buddies. But, yeah, the ferns, when they come up, they shoot straight up, and then they're all furled in, just like a violin's head, which is how it got its name. And you want to get it right when it's in that... Like that state where it's furled. And then those are just wonderful sauteed in 
butter, salt, and pepper. That's like the forager's recipe right there. Lots of butter, salt, and pepper, and you're good. <laughs> butter makes anything taste better. No, exactly. It really does. That is, it's the best. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so, as for our listeners here, what, uh, I guess, are the, maybe some quick tips of the trade that, as if you're new, kind of coming mm-hmm. into this, um, I know for me, it's always like, I, I usually have a person that knows more about it than I do. Yeah. And that's helpful. Oh, but yeah. But what are some resources maybe that you, you look to? So, I would say, number one, find somebody that already knows the species. And then what I would say is there's some really great books on there. There's Edible Wild Plants by, I think it's John or Thomas Thayer. And he has a perfect edible guide for any of the na- like native wild edibles in no- the North Americas. And that is just a Bible of foraging. It is yeah. one of the best books. He tells you what it is. He tells you how good it is. And he's gone out and found all of these. And when you're out there trying to find certain species, what I recommend is go and try to find one species. Like, say if you're trying to go out for a fiddlehead, you go out and just look for fiddleheads. Don't look for anything else. Don't try to get everything. Just don't learn one track. Tra- side tracks and find uh, something else. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, just go with, like, the whole... Intent like, of learning. Intent of learning that one species. And then once you find it, and then once you identify it, and you're sure of it, and you have another guy with you that can confirm it for you... Then you can start learning that species. And once you have it figured out, then that's in your repertoire. Then you start it all over and you start with another species. Yeah. And there is such a rich biodiversity of plants and fungi that is out there that a lot of people don't really know much about. Like I was looking up certain grasses and then I, I look online for it and then I found the scientific name and then I look at like uses and there's nothing. Nobody's done research on them and they're completely unknown besides the name. And so there's such a wealth of just figuring out and finding out and being an explorer in all these realms that we have no clue what happens even in our backyards. And it's yeah. really beautiful that we can just go and look at it all. Granted, there's the choice plants, but a lot of the choice plants are well known. That's why they're choice. That's why they're right. good. Yep. But there's so much that we don't know. Yeah. And a lot of the choice ones, you know, if you don't have property of your own or you be in a state park or something where other people are also probably yep. looking. Yeah. And so. Do you know some of the more unknown ones, then yeah. you might be able to take advantage of those. And- oh, exactly. And most people don't forage at all. And in all of Minnesota's st- state parks, for example, you can forage. It is completely legal to forage. They're trying to pass a, a law in Minnesota where it stopped you from taking uh, big amounts of them. But I don't know how they would ever enforce that. And the other part of it is, too, is... Those mushrooms are going to go bad in two days. <laughs> right. So it's like if you go and harvest a whole bunch of them because they're ready, it makes sense to harvest the whole bunch of them because they're ready. It does not, you, you shouldn't. I mean, unless someone walked behind you that same day. Oh, exactly. You know? But the odds of that are minuscule <laughs> given the amount of things that people just don't even think about or don't even want to yeah. forage. It's like if yeah. it doesn't come wrapped in plastic. That's not food for a lot of people. True. Which, yeah. is, which is sad. Which is sad because you look, it's like, like I saw this analogy where. These guys are planting carrots. So they go, they plant carrots, the carrot grows, it's covered in dirt. A guy rips it out, puts it on a truck, it gets washed again, gets managed by hands again, gets put in the grocery store. Other people like root through it and feel them all and put them in bags. Then you go and buy it. Then you bring it to your kitchen, you wash it, it drops on the floor, you throw it away because it's dirty. It's like, that just <laughs> makes no sense to me. Whatever. Like, because everything comes from the earth. Like, all yeah. of, like... Everything we eat, like even meat, meat comes from the earth because the animals eat the, the greens. And so it's like a beautiful cycle. Yeah. It's like everything comes from the dirt. I don't think there's anything wrong with being dirty unless yeah. you smell really, really bad. But <laughs> it's just dirt. That reminds me of one other one that we saw yesterday was the ground bean. Oh, yeah, the ground bean. Yeah, I, I'd never heard of that before. Yeah, so it's, uh, so it's ground bean or it's also known as hognut. And that grows all over in the woods. And what it is, is it's a little bean that's in the soil. You generally harvest it in the fall. That's when they reach maturity. And what you have to do is you dig them up and then you go and you pick out all these little beans. And then you can just treat them as any other bean. They're very good. I also recommend butter. Like, I have to. (laughs) (laughs) But they're just one of the best tasting beans I've ever had. And they are, well, they're beanie. That's the good... (laughs) That's a terrible word for this, but <laughs> let me see. But yeah, they're, I wouldn't say. Like kind of like 
water they're, chestnutty or not necessarily? They're not really chestnutty at all. Okay. They're just more of a bean. I'd say it's a mix between like a pinto bean and a kidney bean. Somewhere right in there. Okay. But it's a very creamy, it's a very good bean. And the cool thing about them is they're all out there. There's huge groves of them. And you just have to take a shovel in the fall, dig them out, and pick out all the ground beans. The other thing about it, too, is that when you go harvest them, that actually helps the plants. Because they need that rooting around in the soil to spread out and to take over new places. So if you go and you harvest half of it, like half of a big patch, you actually help that patch out next year and it'll be even bigger than it was the year before. So actually going out and foraging these things helps the plant species propagate. A lot of people think that, oh, you just take it and then you, it's just gone. You can never go again. But no, those plants actually need you to root around in it. And deer like them too, because deer run around in the woods and you can see patches where deer all go through and just rut through and eat all the roots. And then the next year, when you walk through it, it's the whole thing's green again. It has all new species, all new plants. Yeah. So foraging actually helps the environment that you live in. It actually produces more, which is the beauty of foraging. Like, as long as you don't go and just kill everything, it's and that's hard to do to begin with. You'd have yeah. to spray something. We're definitely but, competing with the animals. And sometimes I swear the deer found my morel spot back home before oh, I do. 100%. <laughs> it's happened to me with chicken of the woods. I've seen deers eat chicken of the woods, chanterelles, yeah. uh, morels even. Like, yeah. Yep. It's like, I even caught on my trail cam, there's gooseberries in the woods. And I've always been told that, oh, that species of gooseberry never produces any any fruit or like very minimal fruit. It just never made sense to me because if you just put that same gooseberry in your garden, it does great. And there's yeah. tons of berries, tons of flowers. And so it never made sense to me. And then I caught on my trail cam a deer eating all of the flowers off of the gooseberries early in the spring. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. It's like, of course they're not producing. All the flowers got eaten by the deer beforehand. And so it's... <laughs> competition, so it's, man. Yeah, it's really interesting. And, like, it makes sense for the deer. You know, it's it's one of the things that blooms in early spring where food's just coming out and it's good. And deer love fruit trees and fruit bushes. Oh, yeah. And the flower of the gooseberry is the only one that doesn't have thorns. So, you know, it just makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I feel like you'd be on here talking about this type of stuff for hours. Ages. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, like, days, but ages even. Yeah. Um, no, it's definitely... Uh, I appreciate you sharing some of this knowledge and this information on this podcast, and we'll definitely have to have you back again talking maybe a little bit more specific about some of these species mm-hmm. or things like that, but uh, definitely appreciate you coming on board here. Oh, and, my pleasure. Uh, sharing some of your knowledge, and you know, hopefully I'll be able to learn some things from this and build upon that myself, you know, and for all our listeners as well. Oh, yeah. You're going to get very accustomed to it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. It's that's good like, for it, yeah. Yeah, be that's easy. awesome. Yeah. So, appreciate it again, Ian. Oh, my and, pleasure. Uh, Thank welcome you. Welcome to the family, and... Yeah. Uh, Looking forward to a lot more interaction. Yeah, thank you. All right, thanks, everybody.